Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering fluid electrolytes and acid-base balance. You know you're going to love this video, so go ahead, like this video now so you don't forget. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Uh, don't forget, I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Uh, before we start it, I always like to start off with a prayer. If you're not into that, no problem, just fast forward, and if you are, close your eyes, bow your head. Father God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for the breath of life in our bodies. Thank you for this opportunity you've given us to go over this information. Father God, as I'm covering this information, I ask that you please help me. Help me to deliver this information in a way that the students can understand, in a way that they can recognize it, Father God, and be able to process it and think uh, critically through it. So when they see the same content again, they can answer the questions correctly. I pray for every single viewer that's watching this video, they've come for their their own reason lord i ask that you that, that you please bless them and allow them to be a blessing to others this license that they're trying to get father god let that license be a blessing to others through them father god thank you for their lives thank you for their health thank you for the passion that you've given them for nursing jesus christ father god I pray that you protect them you keep them and you bless them in jesus christ we pray amen all right guys let's get started first question when an excess of body fluid exists in the intravascular compartment, all of the following signs can be, accept, can be expected except one, rails, two, bounding pulse, three, engorged peripheral veins, or four, an elevated hematocrit level. And guys, the correct answer is four, an elevated hematocrit level. When you see that hematocrit is elevated, what does that tell you? dehydration that tells you fluid volume deficit not excess you see choices one two and three rails bounding pulse engorged peripheral uh, veins those are signs and symptoms of fluid volume excess okay but for that fluid volume def um, deficiency when that patient's dehydrated we would see that hematocrit be elevated so that's why the correct answer is four next question A homeless client is brought to the emergency department with indications of extremely poor nutrition. Arterial blood gases are assessed and the nurse anticipates that this client will demonstrate which of the following results. One, pH 7.3, CO2 38, bicarb 19. Two, pH 7.5, CO2 34, bicarb 20. Three, pH 7.35, CO2 35, bicarb 24, or four, pH 7.52, CO2 48, and bicarb 28. What do you guys think? And guys, the correct answer is one, pH 7.3, CO2 38, and um, HCO, which is your bicarb 19. Why? I want you to think about it. In the question, they gave us some clues. Number one, they said the patient's homeless. And number two, they said poor excuse me, they said extremely poor nutrition. So not even poor nutrition, extremely poor nutrition. Someone who's homeless and they have extremely poor nutrition, what are they trying to say to us? Starvation. They're trying to say starvation. Somebody whose body is in the state of starva starvation, what do we expect? Metabolic acidosis. If the patient, bo patient's body is in starvation, you expect them to have metabolic acidosis. So when we're looking at choices one, two, three, and four, how do we know which one's metabolic acidosis? Well, um, by the way, guys, if you haven't watched any of my videos on fluid and electrolytes, go back and watch them. They're all very good videos. But anyway, when you're trying to figure out, okay, out of this list, who's metabolic acidosis, the first thing we're going to look at is a pH. The pH is going to tell us if the patient is in alkalosis or acidosis. The pH is your key. Remember, pH is 7.35 to 7.45. 7.35 to 7.45. Anything less than 7.35, the patient's in an acidic state. Anything more than 7.45, they're in an alkalinic state or a basic state. Remember, if the patient's going through starvation, we expect them to be in metabolic acidosis, which means we expect that pH to be decreased. 7.35 to 7.45, we expect it to be less than 7.35 because that's your acidotic state. So knowing that alone, before we figure anything else out, we would have gotten rid of two because two, 7.5, that's what an alkalinic state not acidic we would have gotten rid of that because we're looking for acidosis 
We would have gotten rid of four because 7.52, that's more than 7.45. That's an alkalinic state. And you see um, three, they're right there at the cusp because 7.35 to 7.45. So even if you weren't sure, let's say, let's just hold on to one and three, right? So we know acidosis, but now we got to figure out metabolic, which one's metabolic. Now, um, I've gone over a couple methods on my other videos, but this one, I'll just go over the Rome method, R-O-M-E. It's respiratory, R, if it's opposite, O, to the pH, and it's metabolic, M, if it's equal, E, to the pH. So, we want, we're looking for metabolic acidosis, which means the pH is down, right? Remember, respiratory, if opposite, metabolic is equal. So we're looking for something that's equal to the pH because we're looking for a metabolic acidosis. Are you guys following me? Okay. So remember, I said, let's hold on to one and three. So let's look at three. Choice three, 7.35. That's within normal range, but it's close to the acidic. That's why I told you, hold on to it. Look at the CO2, 35 to 45. That's still normal. And if anything, it's on the end of the low for CO2. And then you have your bicarb, which is also normal bicarbs between 22 to 26, right? Now let's look at our correct answer, choice one, and let's look to see why we chose that one. Remember, R-O-M-E, respiratory, if the signs are opposite, respiratory if opposite, metabolic if equal. So that means what we're looking for is metabolic acidosis. So we're looking for the pH to be down. Metabolic, respiratory opposite, metabolic is equal. So if our pH is down, we're looking for our bicarb to also be what? Down, because metabolic is equal. Look at this. Go back to choice one. 7.3, yes, our pH is down, right? Acidosis, we're looking for that. CO2 is 38. That's normal. Remember, CO2 is supposed to be 35 to 45. Look at bicarb. Bicarb is down, guys. Bicarb is supposed to be 22 to 26, but bicarb is what? 19. When we think about CO2, we're thinking about what? Acidity. And we, when we think about bicarb, we're thinking about what? Alkalinity. pH down. Bicarb down. R-O-M-E, respiratory, if the sign's opposite from the pH, metabolic, if the sign's equal to the pH, pH is down, bicarb is also down, so because those two signs are down together, it's metabolic acidosis, and we know that patient going through starvation is in what? Metabolic acidosis, number one is our correct answer, okay? Um, the other method I teach is a TikTok to TikTok tic-tac-toe method, but uh, because I'm not sharing my screen, it's going to be really hard to understand. So go watch my other video on it where I share my screen and you can see the tic-tac-toe method and you can figure out which method works for you. But the point is you need to figure out how to know if your patient's in metabolic versus respiratory versus alkalosis versus um, acidosis. Okay. One is a correct answer. When a client's serum sodium level is 120, the priority nursing assessment is to monitor the status of which body system? One, neurological, two, gastrointestinal, three, pulmonary, or four, hepatic. We're talking about sodium, what do you think? And guys, the correct answer is one, neurological. Remember, sodium, by the way, sodium is supposed to be 135 to 145, right? Less than 135, you're in a hyponatremic state. And more than 135 to 140, so more than 145, you're in a hypernatremic state. And sodium is imp important for nerve impulses. So if the patient's sodium is 120 and we know the normal range is 135 to 145, so they are less than 135, they're in a hyponatremic state, we're going to be worried about nerve impulses. So the correct answer is one, neurological. Two, three, and four are all false. When it comes to sodium, we're thinking about neuro, okay? An eight-year-old admitted to the pediatric unit with pneumonia. On assessment, the nurse notes that the child is warm and flush and lethargic, has difficulty breathing and has moist rails. 
The nurse determines that the child is suffering from one, metabolic acidosis, two, respiratory acidosis, three, respiratory alkalosis, or four, metabolic alkalosis. What do you think? And guys, your correct answer is two, respiratory acidosis. Now, look at our, look at our hints, guys. Go back to the question. Pneumonia. Difficulty breathing. Moist rails. Um, excuse me. It is, should you ever hear moist sounds in the patient's lungs at all? Absolutely not. So all of these are respiratory issues. So the fact that we're seeing these respiratory issues, you should have gotten rid of number, um, number one and number four, right? Automatically. You should have been at number two and number three because both of those are respiratory. Then say to yourself, okay, if a patient's having difficulty breathing, they're going to have difficulty doing what? getting rid of their CO2 because you breathe out your CO2, your carbon, diox carbon dioxide, or I like to say carbon diacid because CO2 is acidic, right? So if the patient has difficulty breathing and they have difficulty blowing off that CO2, they're holding on to that carbon dioxide or they're holding on to that carbon diacid and it makes them acidic. Respiratory acidosis. Choose your correct answer, guys. Next question. Arterial blood gas levels are obtained for a client. If the client's results are pH 7.48, CO2 42, bicarb HCO3 32, the client is exhibiting which one of the following acid base imbalances? One, metabolic acidosis, two, a respiratory acidosis, three, respiratory alkalosis, or four, metabolic alkalosis. Remember the Rome method. R-O-M-E. The first thing you want to do is look at your pH. Is your pH up or down? And then whatever else is out of order, um, if it matches your pH, it's respiratory if it's opposite and it's metabolic if it's equal. So if it matches your pH, it's equal. If it matches your pH, it's metabolic. But if it goes the opposite way of your pH, it's respiratory. So let's take a look. The first thing we're going to do, that is always your key, guys, your pH. Let's look at our pH, 7.48. Well, we know that pH is 7.35 to 7.45. More than 7.45, that pH is what? Increased. So let's look to see what else is out of order, and is it going the same, same way as our pH or the opposite? All right, so we know the pH is up. CO2, 42. Well, normal CO2 is 35 to 45, so the CO2 is normal, right? And the third thing is our bicarb. Bicarb here says 35, 32, and our regular bicarb is 22 to 26. So our bicarb is up. Our pH is up, and our bicarb is up. Respiratory, if opposite. Metabolic, if equal. So this patient's what? Metabolic alkalosis. Metabolic, because the signs were equal, and we know it's alkalosis because the pH tells us whether we're in acidosis or alkalosis. So that pH being increased lets us know that we're in what? Alkalosis. Now we got to figure out what else is out of order and what sign is it doing to um, against our pH for is the correct answer. It takes some practicing, but I promise, guys, if you practice, it's going to come to you like this. This is really not as hard as it seems. The nurse is aware that the compensating mechanism that is most likely to occur in the presence of a respiratory acidosis is one, hyperventilation to decrease the CO2 levels, two, hypoventilation to increase the CO2 levels, three, retention of bicarb by the kidneys to increase the pH level, or four, excretion of bicarb by the kidneys to decrease the pH level. What do you think? And guys, the correct answer is three retention of bicarb by the kidneys to increase the pH level. So let's talk about compensation. When the lungs are in trouble, the kidneys are the only other guy that can try to help, right? And then when the kidneys are in trouble, the lungs are the only other guy that can help. So if this patient says, let's see what the question says, respiratory acidosis, the lungs are in trouble, who's gonna try to compensate? The kidneys. So just knowing that by itself, we would have gotten rid of number one and number two. 
because we're talking about compensation. If the lungs are in trouble, the kidney's gonna try to compensate. And if the kidneys are in trouble, the lungs are gonna try to compensate. Because they told us the patient's in respiratory acidosis, we know the lungs are in trouble. So we know the kidneys are gonna try to compensate. So we're gonna get rid of number one and two when the lungs trying to do something. It's the kidneys that's gonna be trying to save the day. So now we're between three and four. If the lungs are in trouble, the patient has respiratory acidosis. That means they're holding on to way too much CO2, right? They're in an acidic state. The kidneys can only do two things. Hold on to bicarb to make you more alkalinic or get rid of bi bicarb to make you more acidic. If they are already in an acidic state, what do you think the kidneys are going to do? It says respiratory acidosis. The kidneys are going to hold on to the bicarb to make you more alkalinic. You're already in an acidic state. The kidney's not gonna get rid of the bicarb. Bicarb is alkalinic, guys. Bicarb is basic. So if the patient is in an acidic state, why would it get rid of the one thing that can balance things out? If the patient's in an acidic state, the body's gonna wanna hold on to the bicarb to cause homeostasis, to balance things out. It's not gonna try to get rid of the bicarb. If it gets rid of the bicarb, the patient's going to be in an even more acidic state. So when the patient's in respiratory acidosis, because they got too much CO2, the kidneys are going to hold on to that HCO3. They're going to hold on to that bicarb to bring them to a more alkalinic state to balance things out. Three is the correct answer. Okay. Next question. Of all the following clients, excuse me, of all the following clients, the nurse recognizes that the individual who's most at risk for fluid volume deficit would be, one, a six-month-old learning to drink from a cup, two, a 12-year-old who's moderately active in 80-degree weather, three, 42-year-old with severe diarrhea, four, 90-year-old with frequent headaches. What do you think? Correct answer is three. 42 year old with what type of diarrhea? Severe. Severe diarrhea? Severe vomiting? What are we concerned about? Fluid electrolyte imbalance. And last time I checked, fluid and electrolyte imbalance was part of patient's physiological integrity. That falls under the most important thing for Maslow in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Fluids and electrolytes, glucose, nutrition, hydration, ABCs, hemodynamic status, vital signs, anything that physically keeps that patient alive the longest or can kill them the fastest. Yeah, that's severe diarrhea. Now, yes, all of these patients are at risk because look at one, the six month old drinking from a cup because they're very young, they have their um, body water loss is much more per kilogram than an adult. So yes, they're at risk. The 12 year old who's exercising in warm weather. Yes, they're at risk. Your elderly patient, remember when it comes to geriatric population, they lose their sense of thirst. That's why they're at risk for dehydration. You have to constantly remind them to drink. Yes, they're at risk. But who's most at risk? That severe diarrhea. Remember what I told you about that word severe, right? That severe, it's just not normal diarrhea. It is severe diarrhea. That patient's most at risk for uh, dehydration, losing body fluids. Okay. A client experiences a loss of intracellular fluid. The nurse anticipates that the IV therapy that will be used to replace this type of loss is one half normal saline, two 10% dextrose, three 5% dextrose in lactate ringers, or four dextrose 5% in normal saline. And guys, the correct answer is one. Your half normal saline. Go back to the question. Look at what it says, guys. It says a loss of what type of fluid? Intracellular fluid. So when um, the patient has a deficiency of intracellular fluid, we need a hypotonic solution because that hypotonic solution will draw, it will pull fluid back into the cell. Half normal saline, that's a hypotonic solution, and it will do the job of drawing, of pulling fluid back into the cell because look what type of cell loss we have, uh, what type of fluid loss we have. Intracellular fluid loss. Look at those other choices, guys. Choice two, three, and four, 10% dextrose, 5% dextrose, lactose ringers, and um, dextrose 5% in normal saline. All of those are hypertonic solutions. Those will bring fluid where? Into the vascular space. 
hypertonic flu um hypertonic solutions will draw in fluids into the vascular space by osmosis but hypotonic fluids will draw fluids into what the cell you guys need to know the difference so guys number one is the correct answer choice The client's been experiencing right flank pain and lower back pain. Which of the following laboratory value, values would be most desirable for the nurse to obtain based on the client's assessment? One, serum potassium. Two, serum sodium. Three, serum magnesium. Or four, serum calcium. And guys, the correct answer is four, serum calcium. I want you to think about it. Look at the hints that they gave us. Right flank pain. Where's our... um? Flank. If you take both hands, you put behind your back, right where your palms sit, those are right where your kidneys are. All right, one's a little higher than the other, but that's about right. Your right, right flank pain, a low back pain. You should be thinking kidney stones. What are kidney stones usually made of? Calcium, right? Patient can get um, dehydrated, those calcium clump up, and boom, patient's got kidney stones. So we're going to be looking at the, we're going to be interested in the calcium level. Four is the correct answer choice. Next question. The health care provider orders 1,000 milliliters of D5 lactate ringers with 20 um, MEQs of potassium chloride to run for eight hours. Using infusion set with a drop factor of 15 drops per milliliter, the nurse calculate the flow rate would be 1, 12 drops per minute, 2, 22 drops per minute, 3, 32 drops per minute, or 4, 42 drops per minute. By the way, I have a couple, maybe about three three or four videos on drop factors where i share my screen and i show you how to do that nursing math so if you're struggling with drop factors go back make sure you watch that video because i promise guys it's much easier than you think okay very easy and guys the correct answer is three 32 drops per minute and here's how you figure it out you do your volume times your drift factor all over time in minutes your volume is your thousand ml times your drift factor which is 15 all over times in minutes eight hours times 60 why there's 60 minutes in an hour okay so when you do that math you come up with 32 drops per minute again go back um the nursing math is found in my pharmacology playlist so if you want to figure out how to do conversions or how to do um drip factors drop per minute go check those videos out very easy the nurse will be starting a new iv infusion and needs to select the site for the insertion. In selection of a site, the nurse should one, start with the most proximal site, two, look for hard cord-like veins, three, use the dominant arm, or four, avoid sites on the extremity away from the dialysis graft. And guys, the correct answer is four. Avoid sites on the extremity away from the dialysis graft. Look how they try to trick you. They try to trick you with the end where they said away from the dialysis graft, but it's still on the extremity of the dialysis graft. Do we do IV infusions or venipunctures or drop or blood draws or take blood pressure readings? Do we do anything on the arm that has a dialysis graft? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So we're staying away from that arm. So that's the correct answer. Let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, insert with the, excuse me, start with the most proximal site. No, we're going to start with the most distal site. Two, look for hard cord-like veins. No, we want to avoid hard cord-like veins. Basically, guys, um, any vessel that has some type of decreased um, uh, circulation, we don't want to use. Um, three, use the dominant arm. No, we want to use the non-dominant arm. So four is the correct answer choice. A client has IV therapy for the administration of antibiotics and is stating that the IV site hurts and is swollen. Which of the following information assessed on the client indicates the presence of phlebitis as opposed to infiltration? One, intensity of the pain. Two, warmth of integument surrounding the IV site. Three, amount of sub edema. Or four, discol skin discoloration of bruised nature. And guys, the correct answer is two, warmth of integument surrounding the IV. So let's talk about, because 
the question is really asking us the difference. How can we tell the difference between phlebitis as opposed to infiltration? Well, choice number two is the correct answer because with phlebitis, you're going to have warmth. With infiltration, the patient's going to have what? Coolness at the site, not warmth. You see these other choices, guys? Um, one, pain. Two, subcute edema. Uh, four, bruised nature. We can see that in both of them. That's number one. These symptoms we see in, we can see in both. And number two, they're not going to tell us the difference if the patient has phlebitis versus um, infiltration. But the temperature, that warmth versus coolness of the site, that definitely will. So two is the correct answer. Warmth of integument surrounding the IV site. That's your correct answer. A client complains of headache, nausea, vomiting during a blood transfusion. Which one of the following actions should the nurse take immediately? One, check vital signs. Two, stop the blood transfusion. Three, slow down the rate of blood flow. Or four, notify the healthcare provider and blood bank personnel. I've done so many different questions, but on the same content, you guys all better get this right. What's the answer? Two, stop the infusion. Stop the infusion. Um, when you see these signs and symptoms of a patient is having a blood a transfusion, you should suspect a blood transfusion reaction. So you are going to stop what is essentially killing your patient. You're going to stop that transfusion immediately. After you stop what's killing them, you're going to take the vital signs. What sense does it make that you're taking vital signs while whatever it is that's killing them is still infusing into the patient? So you're going to stop infusion take vitals so you'll have something to tell the healthcare provider when you call them for orders so you're going to do number two stop the infusion then number one check vital signs then number four you know call the healthcare provider get orders send that tubing up to the bank all that good stuff but the very first thing you have to do is stop what is harming damaging injuring your patient correct answer is number two For a client with a nursing diagnosis of excess fluid volume, the nurse is alert to which one of the following signs and symptoms? One, weak thready pulse, two, hypertension, three, dry mucous membranes, or four, flushed skin. And guys, the correct answer is two, hypertension. We're talking about fluid volume excess, too much fluid within the, the vessels, right? What is hypertension? Hypertension is just too much force being exerted against the vessel walls. What's causing that force? All that fluid. That's your correct answer, guys. You see one, weak thready pulse, three, dry mucous membranes, four, flush skin. Those are signs and symptoms of fluid volume deficit. If that patient didn't have enough fluid within the vessel walls. Three, uh, excuse me, two, hypertension. That is the correct answer. A client's currently taking Lasix and Digoxin. As a result of the medication regimen, the nurse is alert to the presence of one, cardiac dysrhythmias, two, severe diarrhea, three, hyperactive reflexes, or four, peripheral cyanosis. And guys, the correct answer is one, cardiac dysrhythmias. Let's talk about this. What is Lasix? Lasix is a diuretic, but more specifically, la, la, Lasix makes you la, la, lose potassium. Potassium has a very narrow therapeutic range, 3.5 to 5. That's it. 3.5 to 5. Anything outside of those ranges can cause cardiac dysrhythmias. So you mix that hypocalcemia um, along with digoxin, and that is a perfect storm for a cardiac arrhythmia, guys. What's the correct answer? So you guys have to be very careful with that because hypokalemia, when a patient's taking Lasix and digoxin, it absolutely can put them on at risk for cardiac dysrhythmia. So if they're taking that, they're, you know, there's no choice. The patient has to be on them. That patient's going to be on a telemonitor. Okay, guys. This video went by quickly. We are down to our last question. 
For a child who has ingested the remaining contents of an aspirin bottle, the nurse suspects signs and symptoms consistent with one, metabolic acidosis, two, metabolic alkalosis, three, respiratory acidosis, or four, respiratory alkalosis. What do you think? And guys, the correct answer is four, respiratory alkalosis. Why? Because an overdose of salicylates or salicylate toxicity causes that patient to hyperventilate. So when they're hyperventilating, they're doing this... <laughs> They're breathing off all of that CO2, all of that carbon dioxide, all of that carbon diacid. When you're getting rid of your acid, that throws you into what? An alkalinic state. Respiratory alkalosis. Number four is your correct answer. You see choices one, two, and three, metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, respiratory acidosis. Those guys are not signs and symptoms. They're not, even, they're not associated with aspirin overdose. But for respiratory alkalosis, that's what you should expect to see in someone who's had an um, aspirin overdose. And that's why number four is your, cor your correct answer. All right, guys, that's the end of the video. Please uh, let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section. Um, if you'd like to see more of fluid electrolytes or maybe you'd just like to see more of acid-based balance, let me know in the comment section as well. Don't forget I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And almost daily, you can catch me covering different types of questions on my social media platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.